Hello, I'm Anton Posniak and I'm the Clinical Service Director for the HIV unit at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital here in London, Great Britain. Now there's over 7,000 patients treated at the Chelsea and Westminster for their HIV disease and we've got quite a, a growing cohort because of new infections, mainly amongst young gay men. Chelsea and Westminster is involved in quite a lot of different uh, research avenues um, varying from uh, phase two to four clinical trials. In other words, patients who have got HIV might have pharmacology of new drugs tested, that we might be doing clinical trials of one drug against another. And so that's all the clinical side. We're also very uh, tuned in to other research, cohort data that we provide, as well as basic science research in immunology and virology, connected with various uh, universities, including Imperial, which we're linked with, uh, and, and others around the world. HIV drug therapy, I, I believe, is now entering a new phase because we've got a new class of drugs, the integrase inhibitors, which have shown very good tolerability uh, compared with some of our older drugs that we've been using for many years and have been our old favorites and friends. So I think that the, the way that HIV treatment in developed countries, resource-rich countries, is going to move towards is probably the increased use of integrase inhibitors. We have got this balance about how much money things cost, of course, and with the, the coming of generic drugs, we've got to balance this issue of new drugs and their efficacy and their tolerability versus the older drugs which might have slightly less tolerability but cheaper cost. For patients today, going on antiretroviral therapy onto HIV drugs is a fantastic prognosis for them, as long as they don't come in extremely unwell uh, uh, with various illnesses that might threaten their life. But if they come in and are treated before that happens, their prognosis is absolutely excellent, and we would expect them to live a near-normal life expectancy. Obviously, people... Some people smoke, drink, take drugs, etc., and their life expectancy will be dependent on that, as well as their genetics, their parents' life. But on, on average, I would say to them, look, I don't think HIV itself is going to uh, cause a serious limitation on your life expectancy. So take your pills every day, get the virus under control, and go and live the life that you've always dreamt of living. Not everyone who takes antiretroviral therapy uh, ends up with an undetectable viral load for a long period of time and go on and have what we would call a, a, a normal life. Some of them, for one reason or another, and it's mainly around not being able to take the pills, uh, end up with resistant virus where we then have to move on to second-line therapy. There are a few patients from the past who had inadequate therapy because we didn't have all the drugs who we now have been treating, most of those people, because they're good at taking pills, have become under control. Uh, but there are still a few who have got so much resistance it's been difficult to manage them. But actually the people we worry most about are those people who haven't managed to take their drugs every day, have missed doses of drugs, have taken them haphazardly, and ended up with resistant virus. Once we see that somebody's uh, have got a treatment that's failing, and, and we, we do that by looking at the viral load. We see the viral load goes up. Uh, there are several things that we try to do. One is find out why. If they're, uh, and especially if they've got chaotic lifestyles that we could support, or some major life trauma that's happened, you know, a, a death in the family, a, a personal issue, an issue about housing or social, we try and put them in the right direction to try and help that, so that any new treatments we give won't undergo the same sort of chaotic taking as the last one. So there's a lot of support given that way. Um, and then we do some diagnostic tests. And the most important test, I suppose, we do is to try and find out whether they have a resistant virus to the drugs they were recently on when we found out that the viral load had suddenly uh, gone high or never, ever got down. Doing the resistance test will help to tell us what drugs not to use. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing that we learn from resistance tests. It doesn't always tell us what drugs we can use because resistance tests have their limitations. The ones that we do, so-called bulk sequencing tests, they, they, they won't detect small populations of resistant virus. They really just give us the broad brush picture. But they are useful in that respect, especially as some drugs that we give patients can cause resistance pretty quickly. Also, if we get a... Uh, a number back. We can at, at least say, look, this drug won't work, or this drug won't work very well, and it gives us some handle on what to do next. 
Resource limiting settings are rather different in terms of diagnostics. Many places, the only diagnostics they have might be a CD4 count, and they use that to say whether or not you're failing. Some of them have the luxury of a viral load, but their genotypic testing, resistance testing that we know, is usually uh, unavailable. And so uh, one thing to do is to say, you've been on this drug treatment, we're going to give you other drugs which are... Uh, um, not cross-resistance, don't have the same resistance patterns as you had before. However, <laughs> in most resource-limiting countries, that is not quite available. There aren't the whole raft of drugs that we've got that we could po possibly do that with uh, there in um, developing countries, in resource-poor countries. So they have to go to a set second-line therapy, uh, and, and basically it's based on giving at least one drug that won't be cross-resistance, and recycling some of the others. RDI is a novel approach, and that is to say, where there is not expensive diagnostics available, how can we predict what drugs would be useful for a patient who has failed therapy. And in developing countries, it's either failed clinically, they've got sick on the pills, and the doctor thinks that the pills aren't working anymore, the CD4 count started to fall, or if they have a luxury of a viral load, they see that they've got viral load problems. That doesn't mean you still don't have to talk to patients about their adherence, but at least the RDI approach will then say, these drugs uh, aren't working, but these other drugs might be very useful for your patient and get their viral load back down to undetectable again. The RDI system is uh, much simpler than expensive genotypic diagnostics for resistance tests because what it basically does, it takes the patient's history, drug history, it looks at CD4 counts. If there are other evidence available like viral load, CD4s, etc., that's all put into the computer model. And the model then, based on lots and lots, over 150,000 uh, data points says, look, what you've, you've been on is failed, the physician says it's failed, these are the drugs uh, that you might use now to try and get the viral load undetectable. We're very pleased to work with the RDI collaboration because what we can do is we can provide a lot of data, especially data where people have had resistance tests, genotypic ones, and then certain treatments have been chosen, and then you can look at the outcome of those treatments and also all the other data, the CD4, viral load, the treatment history data, can be put into the RDI model to help inform it, refine it, and make it better. The good news about the RDI, especially if you're in a developing country and you're trying to wonder what treatment to give next, is that it's uh, about 80 to 85 percent predictive of how well you're going to do. So the RDI model, if you run it through the computer and it gives you an answer, you can then say, well, I've got very good confidence that this is going to get my patient undetectable uh, in 80 to 85 percent of the cases. Now, you might say, well, if I had a genotypic resistance test, how good would that be? Well, the models show that's 60 to 65 percent. So, you know, uh, the RDI is up there with the genotypic resistance and, and appears to be outperforming it. The use of the RDI model could be global, frankly. Um, firstly, if you've got access to a computer, or at least you can get the data in some form to someone with a, with a computer model, you can get your answer back. You could send it through text, probably, to somebody who's got the computer and then get it back again. Uh, but if you've got the uh, computer link there, you can get an answer to that patient's problem. Now, obviously, in developed countries where we use genotypic resistance tests and, and phenotypic interpretations, uh, we're, we're tending to be wedded to that. But as the RDI model is being progressed, it may be that actually using that and the RDI model is going to actually inform us even better in developed, resource-rich countries than just using one technique alone. I think for the developing world, accessing the RDI model uh, uh, is very important, especially when it comes to uh, if there's payment around the drug. So you could actually say, these are my local drugs, these are my local prices, which is the most economical uh, treatment that's going to work predicted by the model. If that's not an issue, you could say, could you please tell me from the model which drug combination of these would be effective? So you'd have a whole list. Or you could say, of the, of the combinations that we use in general, which one of those would be the best one to go forward with? So it's, it's a very flexible system in that regard. The 
output of the RDI models important to the physician because they want to know what's the chance that they'll get their patient less than 50 copies undetectable. And so that's what the RDI will tell you. What is the uh, chance that that will happen if you prescribe this new regimen to the patient? We now have uh, more than 15 million patients on treatment in developing countries, many of them on a different regimens. So in those settings, developing world settings, where there's no genotypic resistance, uh, there may, may or may not be viral load or CD4 available, where everyone's, anyone is thought to have had treatment failure, then the RDI system is great because what it will enable the physician to do is more than just guess what to do next. It will help inform their uh, clinical judgment. HIV treatment as we go forward uh, should be more available to the majority of the world that need it. So there's a big plan to, to roll out uh, um, more antiretrovirals through more countries. And of course, the preferred regimen at the moment is going to be a tripler. I don't see that changing in the next two or three years. So in developing countries, resource poor countries, I think that this will be a big push. Uh, and the interesting thing, and where IDI might come into this, is that it can't all be managed by doctors. It can't all be managed by nurses. But people can be trained about how to give the drug the side effects and how to determine failure. Then they can go to the RDI system to decide what can be uh, be given next. So RDI fits in very well for this sort of global way of managing uh, patients. In developed countries, we're of course thinking about uh, the role of integrase in first line, long-acting antiretroviral, so you could just have an injection once a month. Not everyone's going to want an injection, but there'll be a, a, a large group of patients that might, might want that. And that's all very exciting. I think vaccines are a long way away, and I think the cure is a long way away, but it's very good that people are still focusing on those aspects of HIV care and management. I'm very proud that the Chelsea and Westminster has been at the front of much clinical research and that we've been involved also in basic science in terms of collaboration. And I see us moving more and more forwards into that, and I'm trying to answer some of the real important questions, some of which are important, for developing resource-poor countries as well as what we're doing here in um, Europe. My personal interest is in uh, clinical trials, and I head up a, an organization um, which runs pan-European clinical trials. And I think that uh, the, the, the strength that we get from being unified as a, a big trials program throughout Europe will help us answer big strategic questions that no pharma company could answer. I've spent over 30 years in HIV and AIDS. <laughs> I don't seem to be able to escape it. And uh, the greatest thing that's happened is that uh, from talking to patients about dying, especially young people about dying, I now talk to them about having a fulfilled life and to follow their dreams.